Welcome to Radioactive, a show for grassroots activists and community builders right here on KRCL 90.9 FM. I'm Laura Jones, and we've got a great show coming up. Rashawn Leak is community co-host and Zoom volunteer of the night. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you doing, Laura? Not bad. I, I got out over the weekend into some nature. I saw a red-winged robin, a black robin. with. Red, it's, it's so cool. When they fly, it looks like they've got blinkers going because of the wings and how they flash. And some barn swallows up in Logan. It was awesome. Oh, that you sounds tell amazing. I was in desperate need of that. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I think we all were. We uh we went to this. We thought it was a secluded hike in uh, Tooele. We thought nobody in Tu. Uh, no, I'm not gonna say that. We just thought that uh, in Tooele it should be like you know that's not the place to go hiking. It was a little busy, but not too bad, and the boys loved it. So that's really they got a chance to run around and stretch their legs. Well, you know what we have coming up? We've got a lot of poetry this hour. There was the uh, Utah High School Slam Poetry Virtual Invitational late last week, so we're going to get an update from that. And then we've got pandemical poetry coming up with some old poetry uh, amigos of mine, Ken Sanders and Alex Caldiero. That sounds fun. So uh, Ken was calling it, I think, pandemical poetry last time we had him on. So I'm curious. The first time I ever had them on to do poetry with me, I think it was the 50th anniversary of Howl and Alex Caldiero scared the bejesus out of me because he went full Howl. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so stick around for that, folks. Uh, plus, it is Nurses Week. It is the year of the nurse. It is Nurses Month. We're going to catch up with Michelle Tanner. Why does that name sound familiar, Rashawn? Oh, yeah, that's right. Night Train. I was thinking, I'm like, why does that? Yeah, yeah that's she's right. A, and she's doing some plugs, too. Yeah, that's right. She's a life flight nurse. So we're going to check in with her. She's also the creator of OFOAM, and they had to cancel the festival that usually happens at the end of May over Memorial Day weekend uh, because of COVID. They just felt they had to do that. So we'll find out what's going on. And also, what else do we have coming up? Oh, you're going to do some rallies and resources. You got some good picks coming up? Yeah, I got a, I got a couple of things going on. I think, uh, I think parents and, and the community should know about. And Sim Gill, lest we forget, is always with us the first Monday of the month. And our panel is welcome to stay on and ask him any question because we usually do open phones. Uh, so it's just otherwise, Rashawn, you and I are going to go at him about uh, public health, justice, and civil rights, civil liberties. There's a, quite a bit we could uh, hurl. Oh, yeah, at him, we, could, we could definitely throw some things at him. Let's start with Quarantine Cocktails. John Saltis, City Weekly, is with us. Hey, John, how was your weekend? I was a gardener. I, oh, uh, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole garden's, well, it isn't all the way in, but I got a big garden in the backyard. Rashawn's going to have to ride his bike over and take a look. But uh, Let me know when it's ready to, uh, ready to start harvest. Yeah, harvest. <laughs> I'll help <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, if you grow a bunch of mint, then you can ride over with your cocktail, uh -huh. and then you throw a couple mint yeah. leaves. Yeah, we've got... I got tons of mint. Anybody want mint holler? That's the easiest. It's a weed, right? I mean, yeah, we got, we have mint too. It, it is. I, I know I, I chop it down and Joe gets all mad at me. So I gotta, I gotta refrain. Well, we use a lot in our cooking. Greeks do. So we dry it, fresh mint. It doesn't matter, but I've got too, way too much mint. So John, what did you hear over the weekend as we moved from red to orange under governor Herbert's uh, assessment of where we are in fighting COVID-19 in our community? Some restaurants, Maybe yeah. opened. There's there's been some, well I only know of a couple of places that are open, uh, Bourbon I'm sorry Whiskey Street and uh, White Horse on Main Street. Uh, I think Johnny's on Second. Cheers to you. Some of those downtown, but I don't think any other, too many others, if any clubs downtown are open. As for restaurants, I haven't really heard anybody really opening their doors all the way. They're still doing curbside. Green Pig is curbside. There's a lot of trepidation, Laura. I mean. They all want to do the right thing. They, they've been butchered. I mean, the, the hospitality industry has just been chopped at the knees. The PPP doesn't do much good for them because they, you get all this money from the government, but if you have no customers, you're not, you're not uh, do, doing anything except transferring dollars back and forth. So, you know, Kestrel can speak to that when, when, when she comes up in a sec, but it's very, very hard on them because what, it's, a, it's a Sophie's choice. And it's, it's really not fair to them. Yeah, you know, I heard Melva Sign from the Utah Hospitality Association on another station saying that from their surveys, one in four restaurants probably will not rebound from this. Then they will have to close. And margins are already 
thin and success is already hard. And we've got Sim Gill, who's just, I'm going to mute him again. There we go. <laughs> so it's, it's been difficult. It's good to mute a public official. <laughs> I know. I, I've got control here, John. Uh, we've got Kestra Ledke joining us from, from Tin Angel, along with one of her mixologists. We've got Rhea Wall joining us. Welcome. Hello. Hello. We're glad to be here. So what John was just talking about, we're curious with Tin Angel, you, before all this, had made the change from your longstanding location on 4th South and 4th West over at the old positively 4th Street that some of us old punk rockers know and love. So and, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And had joined, uh, or, or excuse me, and had opened in the Eccles Theater, taking over that space. And yeah. how long were you up and running before this hit you? About six months. Um, and it was really fun to be there in that great big open space that's just so beautiful and be so connected to the theater and the arts there. Um, but yeah, we were shut down kind of earlier than most because that is a big building that holds over 2,000 people. So we got shut down on Friday the 13th. Um, <laughs> it will remain in my memory for the rest of my life, that date. <laughs> <laughs> so what has happened? I'm guessing you furloughed everybody? Yeah, um, we, I did not have the resources to continue to pay my staff. Um, I get, it, like you said, the margins are so thin in the restaurant business. Um, and we had just done this big move, which was basically like starting over. So I um, laid everyone off and um, I am just keeping contact with all of my staff and um, doing what I can to help them out. We were recipients of the Tip Your Server program. So I was able to distribute that to my set staff, including my bar manager, who's with me right here, Rhea. Um, so we can ask her some questions about how that's been for her. Um, we really enjoy the Tip Your Server program. If people don't know about that, um, it's a great program where donations that you give to the program then get passed to service industry people who have been laid off. Okay, Rhea. So uh, this has got to hit you hard. Uh, and so I'm curious how you've been getting by. Maybe you can speak for all <laughs> of bartenders in Salt Lake City. Yeah, I, I mean, it's been challenging aside from not having the social interaction that, you know, we bartenders are used to having. This is huge financially. I mean, we don't know what the future is going to be like. I think our industry is going to be um, very different and you know, we're all just trying to stay connected, stay positive, and stay creative. So, you know, making a lot of cocktails at home. <laughs> um, I know that some bars are doing cocktail kits, which is great, uh, or restaurants are, are serving cocktail kits to go along with um, curbside. So that's been really cool to see. Um, but, you know, there's a lot in the air for us. Except for Utah's crazy liquor laws, this is where we find they're still crazy, right, John? Because there's no reason that they shouldn't be able to sell capped and sealed liquor curbside as well. I mean, in the old private clubs, they did used to do that, Laura. They were all package agencies. And uh, I, I, I wish they would open it up for the club owners to do stuff like that. At least that they could serve it outside on their patios. I don't know if that's legal or not in some places, but um, they just haven't done a lot. That's the that's where it leaves people like Kestrel in a, in, a, in a tough spot. The margins are thin. We've talked to some club owners that are on top of thin margins. Their, their landlords are saying, hey, pay your five, eight, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month rent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I will it's say I'm in a very lucky position to be in a county building because as soon yeah. as this happened and they shut us down, um, they are not charging us rent. And so I am ready to open when things get back to some kind of normal, whatever that looks like. Um, and I really feel for my peers um, and colleagues who are still paying rent on buildings that they can't do business in. And I really feel like, um, you know, landlords who own buildings that are specifically to be restaurants should be absorbing part of this risk. You're in that business as well, if you own a building that's specifically to be a restaurant. Um, I would really like to see something happen that supports uh, restaurants um, and uh, some kind of rent relief for them. It's, that's interesting because, you know, they say cough up the rent. Well, if you can't and you're gone, who are you going to rent that space to? Another restaurant is not going to come in and pay you. It's so, surprising, Laura. Some places, some landlords are very considerate of that and others aren't, particularly out-of-state landlords. And Kestrel being in that position, God bless her, because... 
man, that's a, that's, it, it, she knows how tough it is. She's, she's been in a situation as a, as a renter to a private enterprise. It's, it's not easy. I will just say without saying too much, I'm really happy I made the move I did when I did. <laughs> I bet, I bet. You and Jerry, uh, your husband and partner in Tin Angel Cafe, hoping to see you guys open again soon. I, you know, we, we Zoom this live to tape at noon, so by the time it airs, it's okay to drink. <laughs> so, Raya Wall, if you're going to knock back a cocktail, now's the time. What are you going to mix for us, Raya? All right. I'm going to walk you through making a Sazerac. This is one of my favorite classic cocktails. And it's actually the official cocktail of New Orleans. Um, and it kind of ties together a lot of the wealth and history of that city. Um, I'm also featuring two of my favorite um, local distilleries, two products here. Um, and I also like this cocktail because it doesn't involve a lot of prep. So just get a couple of ingredients and you're good to go. Um, so the base liquor that I'm using is Sugar House Rye Whiskey. Um, this is my favorite rye currently. They distill this in small batches. Um, super smooth, really well balanced, nice spice. You can drink it on its own, on the rocks, in a Manhattan. It's great. You can pick this up at uh, wine stores and liquor stores. Um, so if you haven't tried it, absolutely pick it up. It's so good. Um, and then I also have Holy Stone's Absinthe. Uh, this is Utah's first Absinthe. Holy Stone, they're uh, a group of people that are just killing it on the scene. They're responsible for a lot of Utah's first. Um, this Absinthe is really well made, uh, really smooth as well. I drink it with a little bit of sugar and soda water. Um, you can also add it to any cocktail as a rinse just to add a, another herbal quality. You get your anise notes, a bit of fennel, it's earthy. Um, and as you can tell, <laughs> I've been drinking quite a bit of it. So I enjoy this a lot. It's a great addition to your home bar. This is not available in liquor stores and wine stores yet, but it's a great excuse to go and visit their distillery. Um, they have limited hours Friday and Saturday from 3 to 7. It's a pretty small shop. Um, eventually they'll be open for tours, which I recommend. And they've also been teaming up with some local treateries. I was there a couple of weeks ago and they had Bon Bon Gelato um, also serving out of their small store space. So this is an example of a, a group of people that are really working hard to kind of bring our community together. So I really well, like- We had them on last week, I think sometime, John. Right. And got, there we go. And uh, what's interesting is we're doing poetry later this hour, Rhea, and I believe absinthe is the drink of poets traditionally. <laughs> we'll ask Ken Sanders about that. And also Toulouse, and also Toulouse Lautrec. <laughs> okay. All right, let's keep mixing the Sazerac. Okay, so we have rye whiskey, we have absinthe. Now we have um, what makes the Sazerac, Peychaud bitters. Now you can find this online. Um, I'm not sure if Boostique is open, but that is our local uh, cocktail supply shop. Um, so check them out. This is an aromatic bitters, um, gentian root based. Um, this, the recipe, however, is kept top secret as is with other bitters and Amari, if you're familiar with Italian Amaro. Um, but we do know that there's alcohol, there's water, and some herbs and spices, and it has a really bright red color. Um, the other two ingredients that I have for this cocktail is raw sugar. You can also use a simple syrup, or if you're doing kind of like a low carb thing, you can use a Splenda syrup. Um, and then I also have a fresh lemon for a twist. Um, so like I said, this is a really simple cocktail and kind of incorporates all the wealth and history of New Orleans. Just a little background, um, during the 1700s, Santa Maine, a small island, which is now Haiti, uh, was the largest producer of sugar. Um, but in the seven, late 1700s, there was a slave revolt. This was a French controlled island um, and a lot of people fled and went to so what is now Southern Louisiana. So with them, these Catholic French speaking sugar makers brought their knowledge to New Orleans. Louisiana became a part of the US in 1803. Um, and so Southern Louisiana became the largest uh, producer of sugar. So lots of money, lots of history there. Um, so we've got a lot of cultural exchange. 
uh, the original recipe called for cognac. Um, and with that, uh, uh, the, um, excuse me, the immigration, um, there was a person by the name of Antoine Amade Peychaud, and he created these um, Peychaud bitters, which we know today, um, which is in the Sazerac cocktail. He was a pharmacist, um, and he developed this recipe and prescribed it to his patients with cognac and sugar. Um, We're getting our medicine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this recipe is really transformed over the years. And today we're using whiskey because uh, the Flexrum epidemic completely wiped out a lot of the production in France. And so cognac was really expensive, really hard to obtain. And then we also have a lot of Americans who are like in the area. And so um, the owner of a bar called Sazerac, which eventually became Sazerac Coffee House, had an inn with a distillery and swapped out the cognac for rye whiskey, which is not the same at all, palate-wise, um, but that's kind of where whiskey came into play. Absinthe was another product that was really widely um, drank and enjoyed, and so that kind of evolved into the cocktail, um, but worm wormwood became illegal. Um, so, you know, a lot of changes, a lot of swaps. A local absinthe maker named Marion Legere um, created a different product that would uh, replace absinthe um, called Herb Saint. But right when he was about to release this product, prohibition happened. Um, funny enough, though, he became a pharmacist and was still able to distribute uh, whiskey and absinthe and bitters as um, a medicinal thing. So for 14 years, he was prescribing medicinal whiskey. So that's kind of the evolution of this uh, cocktail, uh, which is kind of funny. It's, a, it's an interesting story. So let's make this cocktail. Um, what you'll need is two rocks glasses. I have one that's chilling with ice. So I filled one rocks glass with ice and then I have one that's empty. So I'm going to take a bar spoon, about a bar spoon of raw sugar. And if you're using simple syrup, I recommend using about a third of an ounce, which is kind of an odd measurement, but you don't want to use too much, not too little. So that would be about in between a uh, quarter ounce and a half ounce. But I'm using raw sugar today. I like using raw sugar um, because the bitters and the sugar kind of create a syrup of its own and a really nice texture. So I'll add that to my rocks glass. Um, the official Sazerac recipe calls for four dashes of peixos. Um, I'm a huge advocate of making your cocktail the way that you want um, based on your palate. So some people want a little bit more bitters, some a little bit less. I'm going to use four. I think four is a good amount. So those were kind of heavy pours, but that's okay because I'm making this great syrup with it. It's like um, taking your Tabasco in, right? One, two, three, four. All the way over, really good four dashes, um, good pours in there. And then I'm going to use my muddler and muddle the sugar. And you want to do this, it probably takes about a minute. Um, this is the most prep you're going to do for this cocktail. Let's uh, like a mortar and pestle for your cocktail prescription. It's a muddler, perfect. a big old wooden stick. Um, so this takes a little bit, but what you want to do is kind of break down the sugar uh, and the bitters together, incorporate it so it becomes a nice syrup. So to save time, I have one prepared. It really doesn't take that long. Um, and then I'm going to use an ounce and a half of Sugar House Rye Whiskey. I'm going to add that to my bitters and sugar mixture. Give it a little stir. And now I have my um, glass with the ice uh, chilling. A couple of things, two methods you can use. I can dump this and do an absinthe rinse basically just coat the glass with absinthe. I've also seen people pour, do a heavier pour of absinthe right into the glass with the ice. This dilutes it a little bit. Um, my personal preference 
is a more heavy absinthe flavor. And so I'm going to pour the absinthe right into the glass. So you and dump the ice and the glass is just chilled and now you're swirling the absinthe in the chilled glass. That's right. So I'm swirling the absinthe in the chilled glass that I, I dumped the ice out of, um, coating it with the lovely aromas of the holy stone absinthe. Bert, uh, you can really smell um, all of the flavors kind of coming together just in that one glass. Now I'm mm -hmm. going to take the whiskey and the bitters um, and sugar uh, mixture and I'm going to add it to my glass that I just uh, rinsed with absinthe. Okay. So you're just rinsing with absinthe and then you're dumping out the excess. Right. Abs it's a very strong flavor. Um, so if it's a little bit heavy for you, try just adding it to the ice, stirring it to dilution, and then dumping that mixture. I personally love absinthe, so I like a heavier kind of um, aromatic quality. Then I'm going to take my lemon, peel it, okay? Um, you can get a peeler at like your local grocery store and that's fine. Um, and then I'm gonna take this peel, I'm gonna hold it between my fingers, I'm gonna hold it over my cocktail glass, and I'm gonna squeeze. This expresses the oils out of the lemon um, peel. And if you want, you can kind of uh, move the peel along the rim of the glass to give a little bit more flavor, and then drop the peel into your cocktail. What the lemon does is kind of brightens the flavors and brings the flavors all together and um, it creates a really nice touch to the cocktail. And so this is a classic Sazerac and that's it. You can add ice if you'd like, but I prefer it traditional, just up. And there you go, cheers. Cheers, all right, wait, before, before we go, I need you to do a cheers for me and put that up bright and big so I can get a good photo, okay? So say cheers so it'll switch to you. Awesome. Cheers. <laughs> Sorry, that was so weird. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, Rhea Wall from Tin Angel, Kestrel uh partner with her husband, uh, Jerry, in Tin Angel, which is over at the Eccles on Main. And that's the Sazerac. It is the, uh, you know, jazz fest time and they had to go virtual too. And everyone's making adaptations. And so fortunate that you are in that county building now, Kestrel. Yeah, I'm happy about it. And I also have to say, I'm very lucky to have Rhea as my bar manager. She's a really skilled and knowledgeable woman, clearly. Oh my gosh. Got the whole history. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed that. All right. Yeah, it was great, so Rhea. It's time to toast some folks. So Rhea, with your uh, Sazerac, who do you want to toast in the community? Oh my goodness. Uh, all of the bartenders and restaurant workers and everyone that's supporting us. Tip your server, um, Holy Stone, Sugar House, all of our local distilleries who are out there making a difference. Um, and everyone who's still supporting us, keep, keep doing curbside, buy gift certificates, you know, um, and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Raya. Kestrel? Um, I want to tip my staff. Um, and because I just, I appreciate them so much. I appreciate Rhea coming and doing this. And um, I love the connection I have with my staff. Um, I couldn't do it without them. So cheers to my staff. Cheers. John Saltis, Yamas. Yeah, hi, Laura. Just a quick one also. This is a little, I, I can't go into detail like like we just heard that there's a beautiful uh, history of the Sazerac, but uh, Kestrel knows her husband, Jerry, and his father, and my brother were once partners in the original Ten Angel, which was on State Street. And it was, it, was a, it was a nightclub. It was a beer bar back in the 60s on State Street around where Circle Lounge and that area is over there. And it was Salt Lake City's, maybe Utah's, probably Utah's first transvest transvestite bar. And used to have the share show and that kind of stuff going on. It was really quite the, if you can imagine how uh, it was a drag queen bar, um, drag queen. and, and they did drag they shows. Say today, isn't yeah. it? But it, I don't think they said that then. But in the in the nomenclature of the day, uh, it was it was a trans bar. It was a drag queen bar. That's what it was, wasn't it? So, um, and it was right on State Street. Uh, it was very 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 well known amongst locals here. 
Uh, but anyway, it was my brother and Jerry that did it. Jerry went on and did the, a club across the street called Jerry's Brown Bag. I didn't see him for years. And then uh, they resurfaced back at the New Tin Angel with the name. And I knew it had to come from somewhere. And that's when I was re reintroduced to his son, Jerry, and then with Kestrel. So this toast goes to Jerry Leakey Sr., my brother, Gary. Uh, they're no longer with us. And so all the best to, to real pioneers, if you want to talk about it, in Salt Lake City were those two guys. That's great, John. Thank you so much. And I, I always love to hear more history from the old Tin Angel, if there's anyone out there who, had, who went to the old Tin Angel in the 60s that was a drag queen bar on State Street. I would love any kind of pictures or stories that you have. Most people uh, say, I, we didn't have camera phones back then. We weren't taking pictures. <laughs> so how can people get in touch with you, Kestrel? Um, you could do my email, which is on our website. Our website is www.thetinangel.com. Um, and my email is on there, which is thetinangel at gmail. Um, we also have gift certificates for sale on our website, which I just will throw a quick plug about. Um, that is uh, a little bit of income that's kind of helping us pay the bills as we go along through this. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone wanted to send stories, it's uh, thetinangel at gmail. Thanks so much, Kestrel and Rhea Wall and John Saltis. What's coming up in the City Weekly that's going to hit stands midweek? Uh, we're going to have dog COVID week, sort of. Like, we've been doing, as I said, the community, um, community stories and just keeping it locally focused, user-generated contest. So this will be on pets and dogs primarily, you know, how people are dealing with, with COVID uh, and, and how, you know, going to parks and everything that they're doing. And they're telling their stories. It's another interesting take, we think. So, um, and the, we're doing, you know, uh, really, really well on pickup. There's more places open. The website's going crazy right now. So people are responding to what we're doing. And we appreciate every bit of it. What's the website? Cityweekly.net. John Saltis, Yamas, and ECN. Yeah. We'll see you in. ECN. We'll see ya. Thanks, everybody.